never shut up. It's your boy Marcel Swally. Standing up for one reason, one reason only. Need to burn more calories. <laughs> you know, when you get to that office space and you're like, damn, see those stairs right there. I see the elevator right there. My ass need to take the stairs right now. So I'm standing up trying to move a little more, give a little more energy, burn a few more calories. Love for you guys as we're going to talk some life lessons, talk sports and entertainment and learn those life lessons while we cover the media like they cover everybody else. What do we do first here? We go to projecttransition.org and when we go to projecttransition.org and leave monthly support, you will get this book sent to you. It's this simple. We got to help out the itty bitties out there in the world. All right, we're going to get y'all bite sized stuff. We're going into it right now. Let's go where Shannon Sharp went. Talking about this generation right here and their value system and how disrespectful they are to their elders. Let Shannon rip on and let's talk through this. When did it become cool? I don't know when because I missed that generation mm -hmm. to be disrespectful. Right. I don't care if somebody only a couple of years old. We were, it was always yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. We were never allowed to be disrespectful right. under no circumstance. Mm -hmm. Not these kids. They don't care. And the parents don't hold them accountable. Right. The parents think it's cute, too. But yes. little do you know, my grandma used to tell me all the time, she'd say, boy, you can listen to me on the outside of you, but somebody on the inside, exactly. but somebody going to tell you what to do sooner or yeah. later. <laughs> boy, Ocho be getting that flavor flavor on. You hear him on inside, outside. I love it. He broke that down right there. Um, let's talk about what he's saying. The disrespect of this generation. Um, look, when you're forming your identity, you're always going to challenge your borders. You're always going to challenge your elders. Now, in previous generations, the consequences of those challenges was a lot different then than they are now. So you learn very quickly. <laughs> your ass got lit on fire. You better slow down and you're challenging your elders. But don't act like we didn't do it just like these kids are doing it. Now, they're doing it differently because, one, we all know what they're doing with the social media and all, all of us being connected. We actually see what these kids are doing, those challenges caught on video. You imagine the first time you said something to your mama out of pocket and then she slapped your ass and that was caught on video. Well, now they ain't slapping each other, but that argument is caught on video. Therefore, we're thinking it's more disrespectful. But we were different than these kids are right now, in part, because when we were parenting, when we're parenting now, we're looking at the kids at arm's distance. When our parents were parenting, they were like, go outside, figure that stuff out, and don't come in here unless you got some problems. Or don't let me come outside if there is a problem. And that was a big difference. So I just think the dynamics are all different right now. But what we're seeing, what Shannon's talking about, what I agree with, because of those consequences being different, we see it from sports, we see it in media, we see it in just general life. It's those consequences of when we used to talk about challengers, champions, and now celebrity. And the way we talk about it now gives us so much access to the game, so much access to the people, so much access to all things involved that now we feel so familiar, comfortable, we cross that line. I don't even think it's much different. I just think that the fact that back then, we didn't know what we all were up to. But when you had that access, how did you act? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Growing up, how many of you guys knew a professional athlete? Growing up, how many of you guys knew a celebrity? So when you knew that person and then everybody else was talking about that person, what did you always say? Oh man, he's so-and-so. Oh man, she's so-and-so. You had a whole different layer, a whole different way of describing who they were. Imagine you grew up and you, Michael Jordan was in your neighborhood. First of all, y'all ass rich as hell. But you like, damn, yeah, yeah. Everybody tomorrow, Mike, and he do this and that and that. And then you're like, yeah, I just saw him at the mall the other day. And um, he ain't a big tipper or something like that. You heard people say that. When you get familiar, you get comfortable with somebody, you start going in on them differently. Well, because in general right now, we're all comfortable with each other. Like, to see LeBron James is still amazing. But at the same time, people see the king. Oh, you can go see the king. You can go touch the king. You can go grab his garb. 
Back in those days, it was so rare. So I think the people that knew will go there. The people who didn't know wouldn't go there. Now, we all know. So we all go in there. It just seems that simple to me. Um, and I don't want to blame the media explicitly. Uh, it, I was compelled to do that. And then I start thinking, they used to go in on cats before. It's just we have fewer channels, fewer media outlets, and it didn't seem like it stung the same. But what did King Solomon say? Nothing new under the sun, y'all. Nothing new under the sun. We just got different consequences now. And we also got different access to all those things we talked about. All those people we talked about. Just look what I just did. I ain't talked to Shannon Sharp today, but now I'm talking with Shannon Sharp on the same subject. Couldn't do that way back in the days, 50, 60 years when your parents were growing up and all the stuff that they were doing. So things are changing rapidly, but make sure you don't get blinded by the change, but you see the similarities. So y'all beat it up in the comments. Tell me what y'all think, man. Because I think that right now, this generation, we're not highlighting or talking enough about the good kids, the positive kids, the kids still going to those great schools, still going to Columbia. Damn right I said I'm proud. Still going all these places, balling out of control, now getting NIL money, etc. Like cats are out there doing their thing. I was at the restaurant on Friday. Think about this. On Friday, I'm at a restaurant. I see two people I dearly respect. One of them, top dog. Y'all know from Snowfall, my man Franklin was in the building and I almost broke the code of the restaurant. Like, yo, I need to take a picture. I need to just come on. But we chopped it up and that was love. But access, you know, when y'all was growing up, y'all see Humphrey Bogart everywhere, <laughs> whatever the hell. And then too, Caleb Williams is there, right? That's the homie. And I'm like, that's just different. So with that access, you're not going to have everyone seeing it the same, saying it the same. I think what's wrong with today's generation is what's right with what we got right now. What's right about it is we all getting connected. What's wrong with it is we all ain't connecting respectfully. You know how the game goes. Beat it up in the comments. Let me know what y'all think. Let's get through that. All right, let's get to this next topic right here. Uh, survivor's remorse. This is a great one right here. Mike Epps broke down what survivor's remorse made him do and made him feel like. I want y'all to hear what Mike Epps got to say about this. Break it down, baby. This is one of the realest things I've heard on the internet, period. Wrote a clip. I've been through hell. You know what I'm saying? I did most of the movies on cocaine. All yeah. about the Benjamins. I was, man, I used to sit in Ice Cube's trailer in the morning and be crying. Tears. He like, Mike, wipe your, wipe your face, man. You a king. Stop doing this shit to yourself. I'm sitting there wiping myself. Because I was really, 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 I was really, I had survivor's remorse. I was so sad that I left all them here in this city and I was hmm. famous. And when I would come home, I wanted them to be happy for me and they was mad at me. Mm. So I said, damn, I got to destroy myself for you to like me. Mm. I was like, damn, my favorite nigga. It seemed like he liked me more when I'm coming down off coke and I'm crying and I hate myself. I'm telling you guys, it's a real thing. Survivor's remorse, I'd say survivor's guilt. Either way it go, it's true. People get a better celebration when you come home from prison than when you come home from college. Keep it 100. You right. go home from college, they, they, oh, hey, Brandon, oh, hey, yeah. Come home from prison, they, oh, baby, home, they throwing a party. <laughs> You've been gone too long yeah. from us. And uh, I'm telling you, survivor's guilt is a legitimate thing. I feel it sometimes, man. I'm not gonna lie, I kind of feel it sometimes. Shout out to Officer Tatum for that clip. I'm reacting to a clip that he's reacted to. That's what I'm talking about, how today's generation is just different. You gotta look at it from the outside as it's different, but go deeper into it to find those similarities. So love for him for doing this. Now, what is Mike Epps talking about? And if you've ever made it, ascended, went from adversity to affluence. You know what he's talking about. It's a value conversation. And how do you get to this value conversation that brings that guilt that he was talking about? As simple as this. When you make it, you know, and the people who didn't make it know that the road to success and failure look almost exactly the same. Let me give it to you like this. You're like, what? No, it don't. Yes, it does. We all went to practice. Mm-hmm. You balled, I balled. 
You went to that school, I went to this school. You working out, I'm working out. You all state, I'm all state. You all American, I'm all American. You get drafted where? I don't get a look. Nah, you got a look. But they ain't look at you as hard as they looked at me. Then you get on the team, it fizzles out. But most people don't even have that type of success parallel. Most people have, wow, we on the same team, we doing the same workouts, we getting it in, you good, I'm good. You get an opportunity. I don't. Some people don't even get it that close. Some people say, all right, we both on the same team, we both doing the same workouts, we both trying to go get it. You starting, I'm on the bench. I can keep going. But the point is, we do a lot of the same things, but it ain't turning out the same. So then, once you really make it, I'm talking about putting a cherry on top, bow on that gift. You know what starts to happen? Everybody has been here. The first thing you ask yourself when you debrief, decompress, everybody was cheering you, you saw some haters, whatever, you had your big party, you felt the love, you went back, you showed up, you showed out, you took all your boys out, you took them on trips, you bought the dinners, you did all that, got them the rollies, all that stuff. One day, you're going to sit there quietly and you're going to ask yourself, why me? Simple as that. Why me? Not because just of the work, because you're going to know. You're going to rationalize it and say, they work too. I worked out with him. But right before I got there, we were working out together. Why me? So let me give you a lighthearted way of seeing it. Because y'all going in the game, being single, like the mingle, dating, hanging out, right? Ah, how many times you saw the beautiful girl? You know, the one that everybody was scared to talk to at the club, but everybody was talking to, but nobody would get her number. Y'all remember those days? And every time you got somebody attention that was hard to get, she that fine. Oh my God. Tiffany Cambridge, right? You're like, ah, oh, she want to hang out. When you start talking for real, it always gets to this conversation of you see so many pretty girls. You see so many. Why me? You're like, damn. No matter who, what, every single girl I ever dated, why me? I was like, what do you mean, why you? And then I was like, damn, I had to reflect. Because when I got my gifts, when I got my presence, I was like, damn. I, thank you, thank you. Why me? And that conversation right there is what survivor's remorse is. Because you're trying to wrestle with the fact that you feel like you got selected to a degree. Everybody out there that's really trying to make it is grinding. Y'all think sometimes, it feels like people think, that in this locker room, the best players are the ones working the hardest. <laughs> yes, that is a prerequisite. You got to work hard. But the hardest, man, you know what I mean? Every single team I've been on, there was a guy who didn't touch the field damn near, who was working his butt off. Go look at them undrafted cats in the league. Them cats that make it to that last cut and then don't go. I, I mean, it's amazing. And cats that play know what I'm talking about. We grind it too. Don't get it twisted. But then you be like, damn, that dude, dude, you did what? And still didn't get a sniff. How many people you work with? First in, last out. No acknowledgement. Maybe it's you. No promotion. Maybe it's you. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And that's where the survivor's remorse kicks in. Because when you become that person, sometimes you look at all those you were climbing with and be like, how did I get to the mountaintop? And you didn't. That's what he was speaking of. Now, once you answer that value conversation, you got to be positive and you got to believe, hey, I did put in the work and I am valuable and it's not an indicator of who they are. And that's where the rub is. They start hating or you start getting high on yourself and start thinking different and your feet get off the ground and that's when you get the issues. But Mike Epps just got challenged with how valuable he thought he was. Sounds like growing up, Mike Epps, wasn't believing like it's going to turn out the way it turned out. And then that gets challenged when it turns out that way. Imagine you growing up and you don't have that deep value of like, yo, I'm going to get this. And then you got that. You're like, how did I get this? Survivor's remorse. So beat it up in the comments. If you guys ever 
dealt with survivor's remorse. And if you haven't, I mean, you ain't done shit. No, I'm just, let me stop. Y'all figure it out in them comments. Beat it up. Tell me some stories of how y'all went through that process. All right, last story right here. Let's talk about education. Education is getting beat up left and right. Ah, right, y'all don't need to go to college no more. Ah, right, what's the point of going to school? Man, I know somebody who, who got a billion dollars and, and, and he dropped out of school. Oh, Zuckerberg didn't even finish Harvard. Like, you know, I get it. I get it. All these outliers, right? And I understand it's a flawed system right now. We get it. We get it. Just like we flawed people. We get it. We still going to be us. And those schools still should be schools. And they should still teach education. Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about what education looks like and what it really means to go to class, especially math, and learn to be educated. Pretty deep. Listen to this. People think that when they take math in school, there's the common response like, I will never need to use this for the rest of my life as they learn trig identities or the Pythagorean theorem or whatever it is that we all remember learning, feeling pretty sure it's never going to show up again. But that misses something important. It misses the fact that the act of learning how to do the math establishes a new kind of brain wiring in your mind, a kind of problem solving brain wiring. So it's not about what you learned, it's about what methods, tools, and tactics you had to develop in order to solve the problem that you may never see again for the rest of your life, but you will see other problems where these methods and tools will become immensely <coughs> valuable to you. Well, the point is, well, what did you do to conduct the research? What did you do to compose the sentences? Your choice of words to communicate an idea, a fresh idea on top of already known ideas. That is the value of education. Man, 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 education. I mean, we all grew up hearing about how that is the pillar to success, education, you know. Remember when people used to come to the auditorium and tell us, say, no to drugs and, and go far in education and study, and you'd be sitting there like, yeah, that don't feel like that's the way out. <laughs> that doesn't feel like that's the route to success. But <clears throat> the route to success is education. As you know, because success has to be conditioned. You have to be prepared. You have to be hardwired. And then you have to have new wirings, like he just said, new levels of thought and thinking to become successful. It starts when you're a baby. Babies are blobs. I mean, dependent as you can get. Humans especially. Man, we pop a kid out and that kid can't do anything for years, right? Versus... You look at the other animals, they pop, you, all right, better go. You better handle that. <laughs> like you better, you're on your own. And having itty bitties, you see it. Like they, if they're going to be successful, have to be programmed, have to be wired, have to be conditioned. That's why the best at anything, athletics, you got to be in shape first. You can't do anything out of shape which is out of conditioning, which is you haven't prepared yourself. We always think physically, but it's more than just physically. You haven't even envisioned that play. You haven't ran through that play. And if you do know that play, do you know the alternative routes if that play is confronted with a challenge? You see what I'm saying? Like you can't just say, oh, okay, I got to go up five yards and make it out. All right, okay. What happens if he sits on that? Oh. That's conditioning you went through. You got all the different applications that you will now apply to that circumstance, to that problem. That's the value of education. The best way to say it is education helps you build your hardware to apply the world's software. It helps you build your hardware to apply to the world's software. Once you got this machine going, oh, give me that issue. Give me that problem. Give me that opportunity. Give me that challenge. Let's go. Because you got the hardware to do it. If you got that fire bomb eSports computer, <laughs> you put anything in that thing. How many damn USB ports you need, right? That's how you have to be. A mixing board. I use it in DJ terms. You've seen some mixing boards. We've seen four track, eight track, 16 track, 32 track, 64 track, 128 track. Yep. Y'all ever go to like a big festival and look at the soundboard and all those different inputs and outputs? That's how you got to be. And education 
is giving you all of those different channels, math, science, reading, comprehension, English, physics, whatever it may be, channel, 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 channel. And then you're sitting there like, man, I ain't going to use that no more. Have you ever looked at the mixing board? You ever look at it for real? Sometimes there's a knob barely on. It doesn't look fully pitched, all maxed out. That would be distortion. That wouldn't sound good. You wouldn't rock out at Rolling Loud hearing all the knobs pushed to the top. You know what it looks like? A wave, right? Sometimes a crescendo. Sometimes you just see them. They're all over the place to create that beautiful sound, that beautiful life. Education gives you that well-roundedness where you can have that beautiful experience. There. You're confident, you're prepared, and whatever comes your way, let's go. So that's why education is important. Now, you get into all the different levels and degrees of it and what school matters. And There are certain schools that give you better reputation, which gives you better opportunities, etc. Not even talking that lane. I'm talking about simply building yourself up, being well-versed, prepared, and confident. So therefore, whatever comes your way, you're ready to attack it and come out victorious. So... Tell me what you think about the value of education because I, I walk up to itty bitties all day and as soon as I hear them talking about, oh, I'm going to shortcut this and do that, I was like, no, you're not. You can do both. You can do it all. Student athletes especially. Oh, if I see another dude tomorrow, man, I'm balling, dog. I'm balling, dog. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You ain't going to ball forever. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. LeBron is 39, 40, can't escape allegations right now because he's doing something that is just out of this world. Balling out of control at that age. When Jordan was that age, we saw how he was falling apart. Kobe didn't even make it that far and he was falling apart. Rest in peace. Point being, these are dudes, we're talking about 40 and under. Rap. Best ever do it. Rap. Remember Kareem at the end of his career? Going up the court like this, magic, like, come on, man, showtime. He's like, man, I ain't got no time. <laughs> like Kareem wasn't getting up and down the court. 40 max. You got to be Tom Brady, 45. Max, max, max. What you going to do then? Or, or unless you're telling me at 45, that's raps. I just going to take my money and get fat like me. That's <laughs> chill. It ain't going to go down like that. So make sure you guys understand and preach. Be a megaphone to the value of education. Y'all agree with me? Y'all agree with Neil? Y'all agree? That education is key. Let's talk about it. Beat it up in the comments. Even if you disagree, I'm listening to your dumb ass. Let me stop. All right, coming up next, so never shut up. Phone up some comments. Why this world will get up out of here next? Never shut up from Brinks TV and Reese TV. Oh, if I were warmed up, I hit that thing. Well, I'm gonna start walking out here. Welcome back to Never Shut Up. It's your boy Marcel Swally. Yay, yay. Where that Project Transition at? Right there. Bam, bam. Got a locker room on a locker room. Damn, you deep. Go to projecttransition.org. Support these itty bitties so they can understand that they have what it takes to get to where they want. You leave a monthly donation, I'll give you that book, which is the journey, the adverse journey <laughs> to what success is. All right, let's get to these comments. Nick Saban. Funk up some comments. Saban never said ban players being paid. He said there needs to be a structure to it and player mindsets need to change. And he's right. NIL was never meant to be pay for play. It was to build a brand and make some money off your brand and not give X to come to your school or keep me. Ah, man. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but it is pay for play because you can't say I'm going to pay you based off of performance and then it's not pay for play. You are not even in the NIL position unless you balling, right? You're playing. So then we're going to pay you. Why are we paying you? We're paying for your play. We could get into the semantics, but long story short, the, the cream rises to the top. 
And then when you get to the top, that money going to drop right on your head. And there's going to be an upper class and no middle class and a lower class and incentive shape behavior. So you can't have a pay for play. And then all of a sudden that doesn't change how these kids act. Same with you. Same with everybody. Hey, all right, sports media, we want you to interview athletes and just be nice and talk about how good they are. Okay, okay. And make a gang of money, right? Be Bob Costas or something. Then all of a sudden, hey, talk trash about them. Talk that shit. Get your money up. You mean what? You get your Skip Bayless, you get your Stephen A. It, it, the money changes it all. We know how the game go. So stuff, it's going to happen with the kids. Same thing's going to happen with college basketball, football, all of them. You introduce money, and then you reward behavior, and then that shapes everybody's behavior because of those incentives. Simple as that. So I, I know what Nick is saying, but he also wasn't up for the challenge. He also wasn't conditioned at his age to do what it takes to do it. We all, every business fails for two reasons. One, wasn't really executed well, whatever. And two, the real reason, you can almost say there's only one reason every business fails. No more money, <laughs> right? It's whatever. And we don't want to spend no more money after this because it's we throwing good money after a bad idea, bad money. No more money. That's it. So Nick Saban, no more energy. I ain't chasing these kids no more. He got the money. He just ain't up for the task. That's simple. All right. Uh, Mr. Saban, aren't you concerned about how much these colleges are going to pay you before you accept a job to go coach at said universities? I guess you would take a job that underpays you for your services based on your prior potential. Yeah, that's pointing out the hypocrisy of what he's saying. Sometimes, look, he wasn't virtue signaling, but he certainly was being forgetful of how it goes. And if it goes that way for you, why can't it go that way for them? That was the part that I was like, you know how the game goes. Why are you trying to change it up for them when you know that's how it goes for you? Okay, uh, let's get to Cat Williams. <clears throat> was Cat even shown in that video? Looked like a shadow. Then he dipped out. I watched that video a ton. Never got a shot of his face. Could Cat be having dudes run 40s for him? Well, I mean, look, if you got somebody running a 40 for you, he going to have to run a 4-3 like you said, or 4-5, not a 4-9-7. I ain't, <clears throat> ain't going to have a homie go out there and make everybody think I'm super fast and he run okay run average so I don't know about all that all right oh we got something here last one about men in dresses I used to watch a lot of pro wrestling as a kid but at no time was I ever motivated to hit someone upside the head with a chair thank you uh, but I do understand dr. Umar big picture point as far as what we consume having the potential to influence so I see his point where he does lose me however is the subject matter and the person he's having that conversation with What's worse for masculinity, masculinity for the black man? A black man wearing a dress for a movie role or a black man having 12 children by six different women? That might not be completely fair, but it's where I landed. Yeah, it's not completely fair for this. I'm not taking up for Nick Cannon because he's a homie and his son, little man, is a little beast in basketball and I coach him, right? I ain't going there. I told y'all that, so I just got it out the way. Um, I don't care. If we're talking about said subject, what your personal stuff is about that subject. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that doesn't go with this. I, I can look at you and say, look, I'm not going to go to you when it comes to maybe a fatherhood conversation, a wedding, a married nuclear family. I, yeah, yeah. But if we're talking about wearing dresses and roles, I can have no kids and I can have 300 kids. What's the point? <laughs> like, that doesn't matter. So sometimes that's what happens in this world right now. We always question the messenger. What's the message? Like, why can't, why is Nick Cannon not in a conversation about wearing dresses when he wore a dress? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, when he, like, what's the point? Um, or he could do it for a role. What's the point? So I, I, I didn't disqualify him for that. Um, the only thing about to me that I don't like about this conversation is that it's stupid like y'all y'all really trying to gauge that oh you wore a dress in a role and that's the only reason you got the role and the only reason you're successful and then kids at home gonna wear dresses because they saw you do it if you're not going to raise your own kids do not get mad at me how I raise them because <laughs> you ain't doing it MJ you saw somebody wear a dress MJ we don't wear dresses why 
because I don't want you to wear a dress because that's not what I think a boy wears. Okay, you can call that whatever you want, and I'm going to say that to my girl. Um, baby, uh, you are not playing tackle football. Why? Because um, we don't play tackle football, just like my son doesn't play tackle football. <laughs> like, y'all are thinking it's gender. Nah, <clears throat> we don't play tackle football, girl. Uh, you, you play basketball, mama. You play tennis, mama. You go play some soccer, mama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go get that money, mama. Like, I, I'm looking out for you. And I'm looking out not just because you can't. It's you should. I think a lot of times we get caught up in can'ts and won'ts. How about should? What happened to should? Like, if your child is a beast, a girl in sports, she should not play softball first. <laughs> like, it's great to get a scholarship, which is cool. But why put the ceiling? She should be playing one of them sports that yang, 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 if she can. See what I'm saying? So not can't, won't, should. Just, just keep the door open for the opportunities and possibilities. It's controversial, but hey, when they get to that point where they're like, damn, what can I do? You All your talents into something that you could do. You did it. But should you have done it? <laughs> that kind of conversation. So beat it up in comments and have some fun. All right, y'all know how we finish every show with Wiley ism. Yeah. I don't even know what the Wiley ism is. Help me out. Um, there it is. When you're not in, you can't check out. Imagine you coaching itty bitties. And this is a life lesson. You coaching itty bitties. They playing. They come to the sideline. You put the other itty bitties in and you're sitting there. Watch your bench. Look at your bench. In the middle of the quarter, just look at your bench. They are not paying attention. They are not watching. They don't give a damn. And I always check my kids. Hey, hey, when you're not in, you can't check out. Why? Mental reps. Why? Put yourself in that position. Why? Visualize. Why? Because you need to know what you can do better. Learn from him, his mistakes, his successes. Just watch it. It's the same thing you're going to have to do. You don't have to always do it. So I used to love when we had practice and coach would be like, all right, let's, let's just go through walkthrough, mental reps. Oh, I would just sit there and absorb it. Like, okay, so I'm walking through here. I got to go grab him, grab, make sure, pause, pause, loop around, get there. Okay, keep contained. Perfect. Now, when we had to do that, I learned as well. I had to apply myself, but then I was like, I don't need to get hit to know what to do. When it's time to do it, I'm going to get it done. Case in point, all y'all got y'all itty bitties playing tackle football. I ain't got no problem with it. It just ain't happening in my house. We should play flag, right? But the thing is, man, I see it all the time. Coach is always saying, we're going to hit. We're going to tackle in practice. Like they saying it to the nth degree, to the fullest. Why? Because we need to learn how to do it in the game. And I'll be like, nah, 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 nah. Y'all remember how they taught us how to form tackle and bring your hips and wrap up? Man, you ain't tackling like that. It's like three tackles in your whole life you get like that. The rest of them are like, oh, 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 oh. but you find a way. Protect yourself and find a way. Get his ass down. Wow. In the game, you just going to get it. You know the technique, but I don't need to keep doing that to do that. And that's what I'm talking about. So how did I learn that? I stayed in tune when I wasn't doing it physically, mentally, I was engaged in those reps. So just know in your life, when you're walking around and it's something you know you gotta do or wanna do, and you ain't doing it, look at it. Check it out. Figure it out. See what they doing right and wrong. Because when you're not in, can't check out. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for today's episode of Never Shut Up. Love for you guys. Let me stand up again. Stand up. Oh, it feels so good. My hips ain't tight. I burn more calories. I ain't got to watch, so I think about eight more. Love for you guys, baby. We're going to have some fun. See y'all tomorrow. Have an amazing day. Peace. Uh, oh, I'm about to fall. Oh. <laughs>
at an early age had to look inside to find my opportunities because on the outside there were so many whispers and sometimes yells of I couldn't make my dreams a reality and I thought that was very unfortunate but I was thankful that I never internalized that that chorus that was around me. I was a kid that understood that you had to be greater than your greatest excuse and I had a lot of excuses, I had a lot of reasons to have self-doubt but I was able to develop my inner power, discover that inner power, and make sure that I showed the world exactly who I wanted to be. And it was really simple for me. It was to make my dreams a reality. There was nothing more to it. And as I now stand here, just a few miles from where I grew up, where that adversity still is strong, and as we see through these movies, that it's worldwide, not just in our locale. You see the, the suffering, you see the gangs, you see the drugs, you see the poverty. And there's always one common escape. It's that inner power, it's that ambition. It's having a voice that's louder than those surrounding voices. And I'm on a mission, a global mission, to make sure that that inner power inspires all to not only give, but to receive the blessings that come from giving. And I'm up here right now as a guy who's challenging everyone to give their three T's. And that's time, that's talent, and that's treasure. Human capital, financial, whatever it may be. Let's invest in each other because we all have to coexist here together. And as I look around and I have a foundation that that really inspires these kids to become their greatest version of themselves and to look in the mirror to make sure that they're greater than their greatest excuse. It gives me my greatest passion. Uh, I was a kid who wanted to be a school teacher, but because of my height, weight, and speed, I became a football player. So <laughs> I took that helicopter ride up as high as I could, but as I was ascending, I never forgot that I was once one of those fork in the road kids who was shot at many times who had to navigate around adversity every single day, who had to waste so much of his brain power just trying to get home every day. And so many experiences that sometimes you become desensitized to. But in reality, that is someone else's reality. So I'm so thankful to stand in front of all of you guys as, a, as an example of the kids that we're trying to affect, the underserved, the underprivileged, those who are told that their hardships are greater than who they are. But hopefully we can inspire them all to look inward because everything they want out there is already in here. Appreciate you guys.